Hey everybody, it's Paul with Reporting Live from my sofa. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Now, as you see from the video that you're looking at now, you're probably wondering, where'd the sofa go? What happened to the sofa squad? We're still here, don't worry. We did some rearranging and sofa land, and I actually have a nice little computer area set up, little office chair, and so we're going to be trying this angle for a while. As you see behind me, that's our little campground back there. Hello, camping world. How are you? So I have a nice little view to sit here and research and edit and do all this kind of stuff, so we're going to go with it for now. And for today, we are going to be talking about the Rosenbaum case. We're going to be kind of just doing a quick little overview of day two testimony. Uh, they're bringing up, they're going through a lot of witnesses in this case, establishing timelines, establishing how the children seem to be in regards to health and bruising and stuff like that. So there's lots to get into. And without further ado, let's review. <laughs> One of the big witnesses of the day was Tessa Daniels. Uh, obviously, this is the biological mother. And when she got up there in the stand, you know, did I feel like it was absolutely imperative to get her up there? Not 100%. You know, her testimony adds to the timeline of things. Uh, but of course, to me, what mostly stuck out is a couple of things. A, when she was talking about her situation with Jennifer and how at a certain point she was, you know, Jennifer was sending her pictures and she started noticing, well, why aren't you sending, you know, more pictures of Layla? Why is it always just Millie? Uh, and why does Layla all of a sudden kind of look like she's not being fed properly, this, that, and the other? And, and so she apparently voiced these concerns. And, you know, so I found that to be of interest. Um, <clears throat> you know, and a lot of timeline was going just to establish, you know, she wasn't trying to be evasive. You know, I felt like she was really trying to remember things and put it out there. But she was very upfront and saying, I, my memory is not that great. I mean, we know she has, you know, some addiction issues going on. Uh in the past, presently, I believe. So, you know, that, that situation's taking place. Uh, now, when the defense got up there, you know, you already know how I feel about this defense if you've been watching this. I, I mean, I'm trying to be non-biased, but I, I don't, it's very hard to be with this defense attorney. The defense attorney to me was extremely aggressive. She, you know, was basically pointing out that Tessa is a meth addict who lost all three of her children. Uh, you know, and she's like going through this whole thing about, isn't it true that the cancellations were canceled because of you? And just drilling this in and in. And, you know, here's my thing. I understand that, you know, Tessa made some decisions that weren't that great. I, I get that. She's an easy scapegoat. But at the end of the day, we're not here because of actions that she did directly to kill her daughter. And so I felt like with the defense, I'm like, you know what? You might feel a, like A, B, or C towards this woman. But at the end of the day, this is still her daughter that you know, allegedly your client has murdered. So just have a little bit more tact. It was my whole thing with it. You know, just be a little bit more, you know, less abrasive, you know, a little more empathetic to the fact of, you know, this woman's lost a daughter, uh, you know, twice. You know what I'm saying? So I just, I, I really, once I saw the way she talked to Tessa, I was like, I, I can't with this woman. And my opinion has only gotten worse as, as the testimony has gone on from a variety of people. Uh, so now the rest of the time, there's like several different people that came up. If you're watching it, you see, I mean, they're going through so many witnesses. I understand now, at the time of this filming, I've watched all through day three testimony. And so I can get a clearer picture where I'm like, okay, they're really painting this picture for the viewer to see that these girls were, you know, A, where the girls were carted to and fro, and also when situations came up with these girls, you know, being bruised, where the bruises came from, whose care they were under, because I feel like the defense is trying to essentially throw any mud they can to see what sticks to the wall, but also throw wrenches into everyone, into the jurors, I should say, idea of reasonable doubt, but none of it's working in my opinion. So d day two, they continue to bring these people up there with them or bring day two. They continue to bring this type of testimony onto the stand. Most all of these witnesses all said that these girls, because one thing that I think takes place 
is I feel like the defense, one of their strategies is trying to maybe portray that the little girls are liars, the little girls are out of control, which, you know, I mean, who, okay, you know, does, does that, you know, mean that it's okay to beat them? I mean, that's just what blows my mind about it. But, you know, they're establishing, like, how do these girls act? And every single one of these witnesses is just like, they were fine, they were like normal kids. You know, yeah, they might have had a couple of issues, who wouldn't? you know, being carted around because it, I mean, these, these girls have been bounced from home to home, to home, to home, to home. I mean, your heart just breaks hearing it because you're like, Oh my God. I mean, I just can't imagine. It's like these girls bounce back and forth to places. So there's no consistency for them. And, and so there's that, but nobody ever really sits here and says, Oh my God, they were so, you know, I just couldn't handle them. And I couldn't do this and I couldn't do that. So, you know, one woman even said, and this is, we're going to be, getting into some deep discussions about in, in this case it's defects a dss uh defects whatever the social services whatever it might be they kind of go by different names in different areas um we're going to be getting into some deeper conversations about this i'm going to be also getting into my and my and maddox matt's experience uh that we had going through like adoption and fostering and mentoring uh and i'm going to be doing a podcast on that some a patreon video and then some talks on here as well because we keep seeing this come up in these cases where the ball is dropped or this happens and it just brings the conversation into play for me personally because I'm like, well, here's my experience. I dealt with these systems myself when we went through the whole process of trying to adopt and that kind of thing. And I can see where, oh yeah, I mean, you know, I've got some stories to tell. So <laughs> we're going to be looking over that. But, you know, one woman said that they discontinued being a foster parent because DFAX was so intrusive. And I think also she had had the girls for like a year and I mean, these women are going to, they're crying. I mean, it's, it's awful. And so she's talking, and this is, this is the norm, but if a child's five years and under, when the caseworker comes to the home, they basically have to see the child stripped down to see if there's bruises because the kid can't speak for themselves. So it's like, okay, we need to see the child undressed. So this particular person was saying, you know, they were, the caseworker is wanting their own children to strip down and do this. And now this woman wasn't in the system. She didn't have child services after her. And so it just got to the point where she was like, you know, this is too intrusive. This is making my son uncomfortable. And then it also sounded like there might've been some am animosity. I think it was between the great grandmother, the biological great grandmother of the kids. It just kind of, you know, obstructing things or whatever. Uh, she didn't 100% say, but it just sounded like there was some bad blood there, maybe. And so it just got to be too much. And again, I mean, watching the, this woman, and I think it was her mother also that had helped, you know, they raised these girls for a year. I'm watching and I'm like, these people, you know, granted, seem like wonderful people. Well, I guess so did Jennifer and them at first. But at the end of the day, it's like, okay, they've been watching them for a year. I understand if you need to do this with the child, but really coming into the home and making them strip their own kids down, I mean, you know... It, it, I can understand. I can sympathize on all levels of how that went down. Uh, now, one thing that we're going to see constantly in the testimony with the defense is the defense continually trying to establish this whole thing about a vitamin C rash. And unfortunately, what it seems to be triggering is that the state and both the defense are having to show possibly, I'm guessing, like nude pictures of these girls to the jurors, to the test, to the people testifying. And it seems to be rather shocking. Like the, vo the looks on their faces and stuff. I mean, we don't see the pictures, thank God, but the looks on their faces seem to be like, why are you showing this to me? You know what I mean? Like, uh, like it's, it's triggering. And so I don't know what the defense is trying to go with that. And I really don't even know what they're trying to think about for most of their strategy, but it's just too much. It's too much. So, you know, day two was a lot of that. It was a lot of getting up. This is how the girls were. This is when I had them. This is how the situation worked. This is why it didn't work anymore. And the defense then getting up and basically trying to just trash everyone and anyone they could. You know, constantly using the, isn't it true? And I was just like, the, I mean, just that tone. Isn't it true? You know, I'm just like, why even come at people like that? You know, why even come at people like that? And I'm actually going to it more for day three testimony because some of these women were not having it from this woman. Uh, they were not having it, and I do not blame them. So 
that's about it for this video right now on day two. Again, we're going to be watching this. If you had to take my vote right now, I, I mean, I want to try and remain non-biased, but at the end of the day, the defense is making it very difficult to remain non-biased. I look at it like this. The defense is an extension of the client. And if the client is okay with the way this defense attorney speaks to people, treats people, he talks of these girls, talks of the, the these people in the case, that is a direct sign, in my opinion, of how this client is. I mean, I'm sorry. You know, she sits over there, the client sits over there, you know, she's going through stuff, you know, she's smacking her gum, they're over there chewing gum, you know, with this. I understand that some people have a, you know, a resting you-know-what face, and Matt has one, I mean, he 100% does, he knows this, I tell him this. If you have a face like that that has a scowl on it all the time, my thought process is you need to attempt to, even if it hurts, if you're on trial for murder, you need to try and muster up some kind of a smile because it's not helping. On addition to the defense getting up there and just spewing vile hatred is what I feel like it is. And I'm sorry to say that, but I do. Um... So it's very interesting. So anyways, let's end this video so it doesn't turn into a 30-minute rant here. Uh, again, I'm going to be doing uh, the day three's testimony as well. We're going to be following this case. I'm in it to win it. I'm very interested. Uh, like I said, there's uh, links down in the description if you want to check out uh, my social media that I'm on. Uh, you know, email. Uh, what else do we have down there? The podcast, everything. It's, it's all down there. So go check it out. And uh, that's kind of it for now. So I hope you all have a wonderful day, night, weekend, whenever this catches you. And I will talk to you soon.